discussion will be engaging. Um, I would like to give the floor. Uh, we will do this in a bit of a special way. Uh, the panelists will make presentations and we want you to feel free. Uh, I will open the floor implicitly or explicitly for questions after each presentation, okay? We have more or less one hour, 20 minutes to deal with this topic. Uh, it's contentious and we want you to feel as part of the panel. So, Amy Rono, uh, you have the floor and tell us uh, some of the, the, the issues you are dealing with on law and economics. All right. Um, it has increasingly become clear what, um, what is needed for different countries to develop. Um, and starting with the basics, um, security and the rule of law have been highlighted as the foundation. And that means establishing um, secure borders, court systems that are reliable and accountable, and perhaps also a police force that can uphold the law. And these are the things that you know we can easily take for granted, but in their absence, it's always an uphill task for a country to try to get to the level of development that it desires. Um, secondly, building and maintaining essential infrastructure um, is also extremely important, and this is um, to seek to improve private sector development and also attract foreign investment. Uh, because if you've got electricity roads, railways, and ports, it makes the process much easier. Multinational investments in developing countries has grown, as you would all be witnesses, over the last decades. And it now surpasses the value um, that these companies invest in developing countries versus developed countries. And so much of this investment, though, is done through it's not necessarily done through wholly owned enterprises, but it's split uh, through networks of suppliers so that they can reap the benefits. And in doing this, um, they pit different suppliers in competition so that they can sort of um, see who can produce the most for them using the cheapest in the shortest time. And so at the end of this, hyper-competitive supply chains are, you know, the workers who face low wages, reduce benefits, production speed ups and an array of union avoidance strategies. And to keep costs even lower, these companies and the suppliers resort to you know, contingent workers and informal subcontracting networks, which often rely on women or child labor and then marginalize economies in the society. And this becomes precarious you know, for development and becomes unjust for the society in which they are operating. And so now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Francesca to take over from here, and then we'll get back to me. Thank you, Amy. I will deal a little bit with the issue of justice. Uh, and then, well, here we could say justice, defining it in the classical definition of giving each person his or her due. But we ask ourselves, is trade good? Is trade necessary? Is trade fair? Certainly that trade is trade is good, there is no doubt. I mean, we live in a global world. Uh, some people may be thinking that it's not good, but certainly I, I think they, they are in a different arc, okay? Sometimes we try to protect certain communities by blocking trade. Uh, let's say we try to protect the, here in Kenya, we have a case with the Maasai community and say, well, no, leave the Maasai to live as they are. Yeah, but the life expectancy is 39 for the Maasai because they don't have health care and they are nomads and, and the schools don't follow them and education is a challenge. So it's very easy to say, leave them as they are, but it's very hard to see people dying so young because of lack of systems. So is trade necessary? Yes, it seems to be. But is trade fair? And that's where the question of justice comes in. Uh, for us to say that trade is fair, we have to look at certain parameters. And one of them is the common good. So how do we define what trade is by falling into the difference between investor and predator? That is something Amy was alluding to just now. 
and how does sovereignty plays a role in trade and, and places that balance in the right way so that you encourage investors and discourage predators and not the other way around. So when we speak also of the common good, we look at issues to do with environmental responsibility, social issues, and legal issues. So just to introduce them uh, quickly and, and give the floor to, to Oliver, who will speak uh, longer, uh, we think of environmental responsibility, well, climate change, water issues, dumping, and disposal of waste, waste management. All these are, that are issues that somehow are related to trade, and sometimes because we are in the mind of profit maximization, we do not see the tomorrow. So uh, just to give an example, uh, let's say uh, Apple or uh, Google or Samsung may be producing a new phone every six months. Uh, of course, and they are pushing all of us to convince ourselves that we need the newest gadget because they were the one that makes me more efficient. And I'm a, I'm a victim of that because I have an iPhone 6. Okay, I could have continued with my iPhone 5. Uh, but you say, well, and what happens to that iPhone 5 or 3 or 4 or, or that, that I threw away or, or I gave to someone else? And then that creates a chain of waste that well, could be absorbed into nature if, was, if, if it was following the normal parameters of a uh, consume or consuming and, 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 and managing or, or wasting. I don't know if I am explaining myself or making myself clear, but certainly when we go into the tube of consumerism, we create waste we cannot manage. We may not see the results tomorrow, but we will see them the day after tomorrow. The second thing, the social problem, the gap between the rich and the poor, for example, and yesterday, Professor Rufl, I'm sure he will mention this to you, was in a discussion we were having. Uh, we have had several discussions with, with Professor Emi Amina, uh, Mohammed and myself. We were saying, well, the, there is a, a real challenge the world is facing. Uh, insurance companies see the greatest risk in the future placed on the gap between the rich and the poor. It's not even climate change, it's not war, it's not violence, it's not terrorism, but it's that gap between the rich and the poor which is becoming deeper and deeper and is creating wider and wider uh, social differences which we cannot handle. I mean, if we think of the for example, the migration crisis in Europe, you say, well, it's a real crisis. And it's precisely one of the elements that triggers or is triggered by uh, those social differences, which are somehow our own creation. So we have to look for subsidiary systems to mend that or to address that. It's a great risk and profit maximization deepens that difference. And then the legal aspects, we could say barriers, which are placed explicitly or implicitly. For example, uh, one of the main topics that has been discussed is the agricultural, the, the um, uh, subsidies for agriculture. And you say, well, of course, that is an implicit barrier because creates a sort of unfair, um, um, unfair environment where, well, I cannot save my tomatoes in a place where things are being subsidized because clearly they are cheaper uh, uh, for them or I produce them because mine are not subsidized, are more expensive. Anyway, you know very well about this. So sometimes there is legal manipulation in the senses of barriers between countries or unfair playgrounds or uneven playgrounds that hinder fundamental rights. Okay, again, this deepens that differentiation, that gap between the rich and the poor and has to be addressed. And then to have a clear idea, we treat nature in the same way as we treat each other. So if the human person is just uh, an economic object for corporations, 
where nature will have only an economic value that is immediate. So tomorrow is not in the picture. We will see how we address pollution tomorrow because as of now, the person is only a, a, a sort of a kind of object, economic object that will buy my product and nature will also be treated as an economic product that by simply is, is used for my economic growth. Are we, I hope we are together. I have put very quickly here three aspects where justice and trade are interrelated. And with this, I want to give the floor to Oliver, who will go deeper into some issues, and then we will have a conversation between the panel and the audience. Please feel also as if you are part of the panel, because I'm sure you could also be here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Thanks, Dr. Franceschi, and good morning to everyone here present. Um, we're talking about impact of profit ma maximization in Africa on development, justice, and the environment. And there is a sub-theme to this uh, theme that is not on this slide here, and that was trade and nature working together, question mark. And I'm going to try and allude a little bit further on what has been said by the previous speakers. And I want to ask the question as a starter, can trade and nature actually work together? And this question, in my view, is intrinsically linked to the question on how can we actually eliminate the dysfunctions of the world economy and correct models of growth which have provided uh, incapable of ensuring more respect for the environment, of ensuring uh, more distributive justice. And I've realized that this panel is uh, pretty unique in this conference, um, where we take a, a relatively different stand, maybe, than many other panels will. So I hope um, that you will give us some feedback on what you think. Um, the human and the natural environment, and I'm talking about the context of Africa, um, I think they have over the past decades to some extent deteriorated simultaneously. Uh, and I agree with um, Pope Franciscus who recently published an encyclica uh, that we cannot adequately combat environmental degradation unless we attend to causes related to human and social degradation. So environmental degradation, human and social degradation coincide. Um, and it is not true that the deterioration of the environment and of the society uh, uh, does not affect the most vulnerable people. It's actually the most vulnerable people that are affected by that. I'm just coming back from COP21 in Paris, and I think the theme was very clear there, and I'm very happy that we could come up with a Paris agreement in the interest of the most vulnerable people, also in the context of climate change, for that matter. But such inequity affects not only individuals, uh, that inequity by means of trade imbalances uh, actually affects entire countries. And African exports of raw materials actually satisfy markets in the industrialized north, but have caused significant harm locally as well. So I'm asking the second question, how much has such trade, especially with regards to natural resources, how much has such trade really benefited the continent? Because we are here the land of the southern poor, which is rich and mostly unpolluted still, rich in natural resources, but structurally unbalanced. And the economic powers that continue to justify the exploitation also um, underpinned by the systemic functioning of the global trading system gives priorities 
priorities to financial gain, which actually fail to take other considerations into account. So I'm asking you if there is no social purpose that the flow of goods may serve on top of the general purpose of trade. Trade maybe should no longer be used in such a way that it benefits only a few. And uh, the idea of infinite or unlimited economic growth uh, proves attractive to economists and finance people but it's actually based on a myth, and there's an inf there is no infinite supply of the Earth's goods. So common global behavior shows that maximizing profits is enough. But what does that mean for Africa? What does that mean for the people? By itself, um, no market can guarantee integral human development and social inclusion. And while some experience a sort of super development in some parts of the world, a wasteful and consumerist kind is unacceptable, uh, especially in light of the dehumanization and deprivation of the general people in Africa. So while we are all too slow in developing economic institutions and social initiatives in Africa, especially in the interest of the poor, uh, I think we have to look into the mindset that trade has been crafted with over um, the past uh, decades, maybe centuries, and maybe we have to consider and reconsider uh, this mindset. Put in the context of um, political realities of the continent, I think we can say without prejudice that um, colonial uh, imbalances, leftovers or hangovers, as you may wish to define it, have attributed to that, also in light of uh, the disease of the continent, uh, which is um, corruption, of course. So this follows that um, maybe we should prioritize uh, different goals of trade in future, also with regard to the protection of the environment. Personally, I think most important for this continent is that we get the people into employment. And uh, there, um, conferences like this one and the WTO Ministerial Conference can perhaps attribute to more fairness in the agricultural negotiations, in the agricultural debate. Uh, Louis has referred to the issues of uh, subsidies of agricultural products. This is crucial for Africa if we want to make trade fairer for um, the people. So that it can contribute to what Louis said, a common good. And I know that trade is coined with a different language, not the language of the common good. It is coined with the language of profit, of competitiveness, of gains. But if we take this continent as being unique, as being super rich in terms of people, 1.2 billion people on this continent that is, again, super rich in terms of natural resources, of land mass. How can we utilize this finally in an interest that is more socially relevant and resp environmental, uh, environmentally responsible? And I think that the principle of maximization of profit does not work for Africa. It is isolated from other considerations. It reflects a misunderstanding of the very concept of economy. But maybe we have to redefine this concept of um, e economy also in order to, to generate some change, rethinking processes in, in, in light of the present day culture 
which is purely aimed at, at, at market-driven demands uh, and not an interaction directed also to generate more common um, good. So while some are concerned only with the financial gain, others um, should perhaps be more concerned with the fragmented conflicts and agreements on the ground. If you take the WTO in itself, what it has been tasked to do and what it achieves, I think it is worthwhile to preserve because it gives also African countries a seat at the international trade table. But in terms of a more general concept of trade, I'm wondering whether the WTO can actually fulfill uh, its obligations when it comes to more fairness. And I think that is what this symposium is also about. If I listen to what uh, Mr. Asuedo uh, said um, prior to this um, conference, um, he, he actually said Africa can be the biggest winner of MC10. And I really hope that is going to be a fact. I'm just questioning that if we continue to lead the discussion with the maximization of profits effort only, I'm actually wondering whether this can happen and whether this imbalance that has continuously been upheld or further developed um, really will serve the purpose of having more social uh, justice and more environmental justice um, on the ground. Um, in light of that, I personally think that the growth of gross national product is not, is not a sufficient indicator of that. It, it, it's only a measure of development, but not a measure of the quality of life. And um, when we talk about uh, 1.3 billion people in Africa, I think we also have to define development in terms of the quality of life of the people. And in that regard, uh, we should perhaps look into ways of how we can make trade fairer, how we can utilize infrastructures fairer, not only just to take stuff away from the continent, but maybe to add value on the continent, to give employment to the people on the continent in order to uh, um, actually give the value to our natural resources trade that it is supposed to have and not the one that the, that the market solemnly attributes um, to it. So I want to close with a question that I started at the beginning. How can we become more inventive? How can we eliminate the dysfunctions of the world economy? How can we come up with more correct models of growth, which can prove to be capable and ensure respect for the environment and more distributive justice? I know that is a very challenging question, and maybe you can help us to find a few answers. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Professor Ruppel, there are interesting things coming up. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only one who see them, but I hope not. Environment, trade, uh, the relationship, how to satisfy markets, uh, how much such trade or trade is benefiting the continent, issues to do with governance, infrastructure, and security, and certainly, in my short experience in Africa, I have lived in Kenya for 23 years, uh, you find that it's, it's a fantastic continent, very diverse. You cannot compare Kenya and South Africa, uh, or Kenya and, and Nigeria, uh, but in very peculiar also in very many ways. There are legal <coughs> challenges. Uh, sometimes we take law too easy. For example, you could say, we usually say that you have the copyright, we have the right to copy. Uh, 
you also have cultural changes. There are very many, it's, it's, it's a sort of melting pot of different cultures. Uh, and, and, and this is very noticeable. There are organizational challenges. Let's say, I, I think each one of you is a hero to me because you managed to make it to a Hilton Hotel today, this morning. I mean, all the roads are closed around. There is no way of, of making it here unless you really wanted to be sitting here. Uh, punctuality. I usually joke with my students and I tell them, look, in Germany, trains leave at 3.07. In Kenya, it's between 3 and 7. So, and, and okay, all these are challenges. But I want to ask Emi Rono, in your opinion, Emi, um, is there a possible balance or a possible advantage to Africa when it comes to trade in the way it is conceived? Do we get the impression that multinationals come to reap the fruits to harvest from Africa and only the leftovers are left behind when it comes to mineral exploitation, to, to, to industrial uh, uh, growth, etc. We are all very excited because Africa is the, one of the fastest uh, and best growing regions in the world. But certainly, is that benefiting Africa or is the rest of the world growing at our expense? I would say that um, multinationals have a big role that they play in linking Africa with the rest of the world in the global markets. Um, and they have you know, a complex mix of intra and inter-organizational networks that we can leverage um, as African countries to grow. And also, I would say that multinationals have you know, a great potential to transfer knowledge and to upgrade productive structures. But if we don't have the proper state policies and implementation mechanisms that, you know, that we can use to draw from these multinationals, then multinationals may create jobs in developing countries, but the benefits that accrue from you know, the jobs they are creating and what they are doing will go back to their countries, and then we are only left with job creation, and that's it, the bare minimum uh, benefit that we can rip from them. And so, and this happens due to inherent power imbalances between um, the farms and uh, the suppliers and the workers. So there's need for, um, I think, a tightening of state policies and implementation to ensure that we actually get the benefits that we should be getting from multinationals. Yeah, very good. Now, Oliver, um, you told us something dangerous, many dangerous things, but especially dangerous. When you spoke of profit maximization in Africa, uh, one can get the impression that we want investors to come to do charity work. And charity is not working in Africa. I mean, the, the, the financial aid the, the continent is receiving, in many instances, is going to waste and it's a source of corruption in many governments. Uh, certainly, I don't have the statistics here, but we hear this all the time. So if investors are not coming here to maximize their profit, why are they coming, and what are they coming to do, and how do you resolve this problem that we are not speaking here of charity or leftovers, but actual profit? Mm. Yeah, that's a difficult uh, one, Louis. Of course, we have to attract investment um, to Africa and not, uh, and not charity. Um, that hasn't worked over the past decades. Uh, we have the evidence for that. So we should try different models. Um, investment definitely is needed in order to improve the infrastructures on the ground. Um, but not unconditional investment, perhaps. Um, uh, we talk about justice and environment on a national level in investment attraction uh, may have to be uh, put under certain conditionalities in the interest of the people, in the interest of empowerment of the people, upliftment of gender, of previously disadvantaged populations and so on and so forth. Uh, I know that uh, many investors are not attracted by that, but there is also evidence that uh, uh, in many cases 
uh, that is not a distraction per se. So our governments should do more in that regard. Maybe not follow the South African um, example that is now scrapping all the bilateral investment treaties with the international uh, partners <coughs> is perhaps not the message to send to the world, uh, but maybe um, to, to inform uh, investors or to amend uh, bilateral investment treaties to an extent that they are uh, there are social policies that play a role, that there are um, distributive justice elements that have to be considered, uh, that employment uh, creation is key. And um, I think uh, that's what we need. If we look at the energy sector, this is energy. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we look at the energy sector uh, currently, um, how many Africans actually have access to energy? Uh, and I think that is a that that is an element of 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 justice question already. How many Africans can study at night if they work during the day? How many Africans can cook without fuel wood but with energy? Uh, and I think in order to improve this. Uh, we need investment, no doubt we need a lot of investment because we have to undo structural deficiencies of decades, maybe centuries, uh, but that investment has to be streamlined, focused, with a clear view not only to fill the pockets of the investor, that is also something that needs to happen, but not unconditionally. So that means that we want profit. We should not be scared of profit. The problem is the aspect of maximization of profit, where you are somehow ripping off the benefits until you kill somehow the cow. You are milking it to death. And when it starts giving powder milk, you continue milking it until it dies. And perhaps this has been the perception we have had in Africa of foreign investors. This may come from the colonization period when colonizing powers came to Africa just to grab as much as they could and get out uh, of here. Certainly there were very many good effects or benefits from that period and thanks to that we are here today in this great hotel, for example. <coughs> Um, but there may have been social issues that were not, not properly look, looked at. I don't know, well, I would like to open the floor for questions. I see some, uh, very many question marks in some of the pupils of the, of the participants. And I would like to know if there are any questions so far, any challenge, anything you want to throw at the panelists? Yes. Yeah, I hope there is a microphone to go around. There is an extra microphone here as well if you need. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Magnus Emfel. I represent the WWF, uh, where I work on the sustainable economics. I uh, appreciate this panel very much, highly interesting topics. Uh, I haven't been to many events uh, so far here, but uh, I, I lacked this aspect and I appreciate that you brought it up. Um, maybe to add to your, to your conversation and um, to ask you with your, your experience in, 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 um, in from Africa, when you talk about the risks of uh, maximizing profits, uh, I think we all can see that risk. And what, what if not, what else then you say? Uh, and I'm thinking about the uh, example we've seen now uh, globally about the risk of climate and the investments in climate, where also the financial community has become aware of there is actually risks in investing in certain kinds of, of, uh, of uh, energy resources. And those are not only sort of climate and environmental risks, those are financial risks. And they've been really appreciated and starting to hopefully, we haven't seen it yet, but hopefully um, change uh, the way that uh, financial community address energy. Um, and the concept used there uh, it's often called value at risk, where the investor looks at the value they have in the portfolio and realizes that they don't really have a complete picture of that 
the risk of a value. And value at risk also includes, oh, it's a value, you have referred to here, the, the rich values and the rich assets here of Africa, but also the risks. So my question would be, um, is there any sign of, is there an example of how values at risk, and the, the question to the ma maximizing profit, what is that if it's not maximizing? Uh, for these investors are often long-term profits. They need, they need to understand these kind of risks to be able to assure long-term profit, which I think is very much what is on the agenda here and what is in, in the interest of Africa. So what are the signs of using, applying um, a different kind of risk assessment and including those in decisions to, to make wise investments which provide long-term profit? Thank you very much. My name is Edward Gwembo, student at Kenya School of Law. And basically, I have more of a contribution and a few questions just to go by. So if you just start or to start it off, basically, if you look at the tragedy of Africa, um, it all started right from the point of colonization, where we had trade systems that were actually, our trade systems were not allowed to grow organically. We had our colonizers come in place and transplant for us like what they thought would work for us. And, excuse me. and this led us to really take into something that we did not understand. And to date, I think that is what we're still grappling with. And to move to this now that comes, we have to really stop talking about what happened and start coming up with solutions. And what are these solutions? Um, there's a comment that was made that environmental degradation goes hand in hand with social degradation. So how do we address this? We really need to see more and more Africans come up like Professor Wangari Madai, 2004 Nobel laureate, who was able to actually come out and stand up and fight for the environment and say that you will not take down Uhuru Park to come up with skyscrapers because we want our city to look in such and such a manner. So you see, that is one way that when we speak, what are we doing ourselves as Africans? Are we just sitting back and letting other people make these policies, make these decisions for us? How are we participating and getting involved in this one? Secondly, if you look at it, it also now touches on governance. What is the role of government? What is the role of legislators? Are they really putting a better emphasis on profit maximization as compared to going looking at also the effects of developing a country in such a manner and to that extent now my final point becomes a challenge now you look at TDS and the kind of symposiums that we are actually you know organizing at 25 years I have my life to live ahead and God knows I'll be seated where you are one day and having you know debating or moderating such a session but what capacity building is being given to me as an upcoming you know debater or a legislator name it, how is TDS involving students and everyone else to bring them up to become, you know, the kind of debaters that you want to see with African agenda at hand. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so I think with those two questions, uh, I would like to ask Oliver to address the first one. is a complicated matter of values and risks. Um, long-term profits. I don't know how you want to deal with this and if you will be able to deal with it. I, I will give it a try. It's, it's a very important one. And Louis reflected um, what I've just experienced um, in, in Paris last week when having a panel on climate change and, and insurance that the, the scenario of assessing risks is changing. Uh, I'm, I'm a law professor, uh, so I'm only marginally involved with risks. Uh, obviously, we also benefit from risks um, as lawyers. But um, when we talk about risks in Africa, they are obviously widespread. Uh, traditionally, we had to persuade investors uh, to ignore the risks in order to to reap the investment opportunities because our infrastructures were weak, our investment climate was weak, our dispute settlement processes are weak, our governance structures are weak. Maybe this is changing. Maybe we should allow for a mind shift in mindset. I've mentioned bilateral investment treaties. If you look at investment treaties of, say, 50 years ago, they were standardized. 
like a two-page treaty by the British given to Kenya, given to Tanzania. Uh, and if you look at the small print in this treaty, this was basically a, a sellout of national interests, especially due to the fact that the, the, the nation itself acknowledged that all the risks and all the prejudices uh, uh, were confirmed by signing this treaty. I, I think we're, we're moving, we should be moving away from that. Uh, not like South Africa in, in a, in a uni, unilateral, but I think in a, in a bilateral, multilateral manner. Uh, one, can, one can overcome risks by creating, of course, um, for instance, uh, dispute settlement mechanisms that, that pr uh, provide investors more security, uh, and so on. But you mentioned the need for long-term uh, investment, and that is also something that, that hasn't happened in the past. Usually come to Africa, make a quick buck, buck uh, and run. Uh, and that is the reason, for instance, why our energy sector, one of the, one of the reasons why our energy sectors are so underdeveloped, uh, because if you want to invest in energy, this is a long-term effort. Uh, it requires quite some investment at the beginning, and until you can reap the benefits, you have to stay put for a while. Uh, and that is the type of investment uh, that um, I think we, we, we need uh, to attract in order to really make an improvement to the deficiencies of the infrastructure uh, and, and so on. Statistically, although Africa still has a relatively weak record in terms of uh, the investment, security, climate, investors are not put off by that. And we should ask ourselves why. So there must be something that we have to offer which they want. Uh, a previous panel I attended this morning, someone said, only one-fourth of the natural resources wealth of Africa has been exploited so far. So there's still quite some substance remaining. And I think if we consider that as, as a huge asset, especially in light of the fact that many other countries' continents are running out of those natural resources, maybe we can make more out of them. Uh, in the context of climate-related investments, I think there's huge development space ahead. There are pathways where climate finance can be coupled with, with long-term investment projects that can really benefit the investor, but also benefit uh, long-term development uh, at the national and continental level. Very good. Excellent. Um, Amy. Can you deal with part of the second question? That second question, well, there, there are still issues pending there on the first one, but the second question has two parts. Okay. The first part of that question is, uh, what is the role of government in all this? And um, I think as I highlighted earlier, the role of government really is to act as <clears throat> a watchdog for the citizen. So to ensure that there are proper policies and laws in place, and also to ensure there is implementation of this, so that there's a trickle-down effect of the benefits that uh, we should ideally reap from multinationals and trade. And um, because an impressive rise in GDP um, would mean nothing if living standards are undermined in the long run, and there's poor health or underinvestment in education, or a, widen, a widening gap between the rich and the poor. So really, the government is coming in and should ideally come in to ensure that um, trade and investment facilitates all this, facilitates good health for everybody, facilitates education, and bridging the gap between the rich and the poor. Thank you. Yep. And should we say that the government, more than being a, just a watchdog for the citizen, should be the one creating the, enable, the, the environment to enable business to thrive? Yes. Certainly, I mean, um, government is the one that provides an environment whereby investors can come in and they have access to, you know, because when investors come in, they, they have to, let's say, form a company. And government needs to ensure that, you know, the laws that facilitate the formation of a company are 
fair for investors to come in and you know it would not take too long for them to form a company and begin to do that which they desire to do so that's the other role of government okay and the second part of your question dealing with colonization and capacity building uh, it's interesting you see I'm, I'm the product of colonization and I have two French grandfathers one Venezuelan grandmother one African grandmother so if there was not a titanium, for example, out, and, and this has happened before here in the country. However, the issue of capacity building comes up again. That is, in the case of oil contracts in Kenya specifically, well, we never had oil here. Oil is a new invention, so to speak. And there are no oil experts when it comes to negotiation or to legal issues. So, for example, the oil multinationals come with an incredible team of people who have been negotiating oil contracts for many years, and the government comes with two or three lawyers between 20 and 30 who, who years old who have never ever negotiated an oil contract in their lives. Then, of course, this has triggered an incredible interest in oil uh, law, I mean, oil and gas law issues, related issues, and we have to build that capacity. Then uh, the, the other issue regarding governance that came up in one of the questions, uh, and, and Amy already touched, is we have to try to make corruption more expensive. So that for you to incur in corruption is more expensive than being honest. You see, we have been trying to address corruption with speeches political campaigns, uh, anti-corruption agencies, and it's not working, partly because no one goes to jail. I mean, if you ask me, at least in Kenya, since independence until now, not one minister in the cabinet of any government since independence until now has gone to jail because of misuse or misappropriation of public funds. And, and many countries in Africa, the same thing happens. So, uh, well, that, that's a little bit of a problem. Corruption so far is cheap, I meaning the easy way out. So until you don't make it more expensive from either the moral, freedom, or the economic point of view, we will not achieve the desired effects in governance. Uh, in fact, when we speak of PPPs, we have to know that 70% of the corruption, at least in the country, according to Transparency International, happens in private, in the private sector because that's where the money comes from, and that's where the procurement processes are somehow destroyed or deviated. So we say, well, the government is corrupt. Yes, but someone gives the government the money, okay? And it's happened also in wildlife crimes. Say, well, there are too many poachers. Yeah, but the, the rangers themselves are compromised. So you have now the poacher keeping the poacher away. So it's a situation that will not work. Then sovereignty, legal action. Uh, certainly we need a paradigm shift in the way we look at the state function and sovereignty and my rights and my independence. Because it's sort of, you see, you want the best of both worlds. You want the money to come to you without the responsibility of doing something for that money to come. It happens in, in our countries, and we have to deal with it. Uh, something interesting is that, well, you see, we need, you, we could say that fairness can survive without freedom, but freedom does not guarantee fairness. Okay? Without freedom, you will never have fairness in trade, but the fact that you have freedom does not mean there is fairness, and that's where I will discuss uh, ideas of profit maximization come into place. Uh, I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions or comments from the floor. If not, I will ask uh, each of the panelists to close, but is there any further comment, question, uh, anxious uh, remark? or we have all understood each other and we are speaking the same language. 
So I will ask uh, Oliver and Emmy to wrap up with maybe one idea because we are almost there. We have less than five minutes left, uh, and then we close the panel. Thanks, Luis. Um, basically, a lot has been said. Uh, as a final word, I just would like to say that we have to start thinking out of the box, thinking differently than we have done in the past. We have to change our perspectives in order to uh, benefit uh, the people, and not only a few, but the majority, to uplift them and to make uh, uh, use of the unlimited opportunities that we actually have on this continent that have been uh, hosted in privilege of few during the past, but uh, that should actually uplift the people, have a growing middle class, have get rid of those squatter camps, the poverty that you see on the street here. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, at the wealth of resources and of people, at the same time young people, then uh, this opportun opportunity is, is, should be taken now where Africa is on the rise, but we have to be careful with this being on the rise. This is a, this is a very uh, driven history that, that I think is also in the interests of others, but we should be careful that this development that we experience now uh, is shifted away from profit maximization at least with a dual effect, namely with more environmental and social justice. Excellent. Amy. I think mine is just to emphasize more on um, regional integration and regional trade and intra-African trade because um, if we are able to leverage that and trade amongst ourselves, then we can better ourselves to be able to play uh, in the international markets and use that platform to grow our different sectors and our different um, capacities. Thank you. Yep. And um, perhaps a close closing comment. Yeah, I think we are all, WTO included, at crossroads. Uh, in a way, we need a paradigm shift. The role of the state and the states themselves have to understand this. this that we play down the state and we improve or increase the sort of corporate responsibility, allow people to do business, and to do business with less barriers, but of course taking care always of that social clause and that capacity building, and that it shouldn't happen what has happened in some places in Africa where we contracted, let's say, China, to give an example, to build a stadium they came in containers with their workers, built the stadium, and left. Then, of course, there is no uh, transmission of knowledge or, or cross-pollination, some people call it. Uh, certainly, it's true. We complain in many instances of having corrupt systems. We speak of the executives, the judiciary, and the legislators. Uh, it is true there is corruption, but that's not the key issue. Corruption is always perhaps an excuse not to go the harder way that is the more sustainable way. There is a possibility, and every government has those uh, key uh, opening keys, we could say, where we can jump or go around corruption and, and succeed, and it has happened. Certainly, we cannot I, I think it's a bad business to compare ourselves with other countries that have developed. We constantly compare Kenya to Singapore because in 1963-64 they were at the same level. Actually, the urban plan Singapore put in place was somehow linked to them by Kenya. Uh, but certainly, Singapore is a very easy country to manage in many ways. I mean, it's one city uh, doesn't happen, uh, doesn't have the cultural baggage. 
uh, Kenya was bringing with itself to independence. This is just an opinion. But with these very many ideas and challenges, I want to thank you all for being a great audience, for being here patiently listening to the three of us. Thank you, Oliver, for your contribution, and Amy, the upcoming scholar, well, not upcoming, actually, it's already quite high up there uh, in the legal field. And thank you for being a wonderful audience, and thanks a lot. Thank you.